Good morning and welcome to the 2020 Doctor of Ministry Symposium at the National Assemblies of God Theological Seminary in Springfield, Missouri. I am Dr. John Battaglia, Director of the Doctor of Ministry Program. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us. We have an exciting symposium for you, those who are our live stream viewers, those on Zoom. We're grateful that you are with us this morning. Now, my hunch is that all of us would rather have a face-to-face -face experience. And so that is our heart as well. However, we have a tremendous opportunity that we are seizing, and that is our very first virtual symposium. We are very excited about this opportunity and to be able to bring you in and to create an environment where we can have a very large grouping of people join together to experience and to celebrate our 14 graduates who will be presenting a synopsis of their work today. Now, who would have thought we'd be in this present reality that COVID-19 has brought to our world? But as I like to say, God is a greater reality, and he is the one that we put our trust in. Now, to all of the family and friends, spouses that have joined us this morning, we are especially grateful for you to celebrate your spouses and your family members and their very hard work, their diligence, to be here today. Now it's been said that spouses of the graduates deserve their own doctor of ministry degree. And I'll tell you, I believe that is very true. Now we're not gonna offer you one, but we're gonna offer you an applause to say thank you for all of the time that you have invested and given to your spouse and for their success in their project and what's going to be a project applied to their ministry context for the effectiveness of advancing the kingdom of God. Now we have a distinct honor with us this morning to have Dr. Carol Taylor, president of Evangel University with us. In a moment, she is going to bring a greeting. Also with us is Dr. Tim Hager, Vice President and Dean of the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary. Dr. Taylor has been the fourth president, is the fourth president of Evangel University, and she has served for the past seven years. Now, actually, tomorrow, May 1st, is an anniversary date to the first day that she was in the office. And we are so glad that she has been an amazing leader to this university. For the past seven years, I've been able to observe a leader who is loyal, who loves her university, loves people, a woman of God who knows how to pray and touch heaven. She is the kind of person that you just want to be around gleaming from her wisdom, enjoying her grace. And for the last seven years, she has made a very significant impact in my life. Now, welcome with me, Dr. Carol Taylor, president of Evangel University. Dr. Taylor, great to have you with us today. If you would bring a greeting, we would appreciate that. Yeah, it's, it's my honor. Um, I'm also dressed up. You probably, I'd have to like show, I'm wearing my EU wear. Um, so, and, and I'm afraid I won't be able to stay with you the whole time. I have imagined this a couple other Zoom meetings um, today before we're gonna take a little break and go out and tie ribbons around some of the poles on campus because we should be celebrating commencement. Um, tomorrow. And, and so we're doing a few special things to acknowledge our graduates uh, remotely. Um, but what, what an extraordinary accomplishment as you've reached this point where you're presenting your final projects, your dissertations, um, 
and what this represents, I think in several ways. First of all, your commitment to pursuing excellence in your ability to serve. Um, I, I think the, the decision to pursue graduate education is all about a commitment to say, I want to present the best of what I have to offer in service to the king and see how he might use that as I invested in sharpening my tools even more. Um, so first of all, congratulations on that. Secondly, congratulations on your perseverance. As you are well aware, there are many people who begin this journey and they end up um, ABD. Uh, if you haven't heard, heard that term, um, that's often the term that is, that is used in doctoral programs when you have done some oral defense and before you write your dissertation, you're referred to as all but dissertation. There are so many doctoral students that get to the point of writing that final massive piece of work that demonstrates your ability to do research, your ability to um, represent that well, and, and add your own contribution to your field of study. And I remember when I reached that point as, as a graduate student, now a number of years ago at Florida State, I walked in the day after uh, the, the comprehensive exams and said, I finally understand what ABD means. It is not all but dissertation, it means all but dead. Because that's sometimes the way you feel as you're getting ready to start that last major project. Uh, my advisor at the time reminded me of the numbers of students that stop right there and they don't go on to complete it. So you are part of what is really a, a um, unfortunately smaller group than it should be, but, but a group of individuals who have persevered and have seen this all the way through to the finish. That speaks volumes to your commitment to see a project through once you have started it. I think it also says volumes about your commitment as leaders um, because none of you, as I listened to your own introductions, none of you were able to hit the pause button on your lives or your places of ministry and say, I'm just going to take the next few years and just enjoy this whole experience where the only thing I invest in think about are my academic pursuits and preparing for this next level of effectiveness in my ministry. No, you have done this while you have um, served in in challenging full-time places of service and ministry where you've cared for family, sometimes sandwiched with having children still growing up and caring for elderly parents, caring for congregations, caring for masses of people. And so your perseverance in this is, um, is to be applauded. And I think speaks volumes of your commitment and your leadership and the kind of leaders that you will be in your places of service. And who would have ever imagined we'd be doing it this way? Um, I've been reading the, the last actually couple of weeks, but especially this week's, the, the postings of our graduates and their reflections of finishing the semester. And it, it's so very moving. It's bittersweet, right? We wanted to do this in person where the high fives could actually be our hands touching together, um, but, but we're not. Um, and so I'm still searching. I know it's somewhere in the Bible, the verse that says, blessed are the flexible. Uh, that, that's a verse we quote often um, before, because they shall not be broken. And so um, congratulations as well on persevering to this day and, and engaging in these presentations, perhaps in a format that you had not imagined. Um, and yet you, you continue to persevere. Seasons like this, I, I, uh, I often remind myself um, because we are often caught unawares, right? We say, whoa, didn't see that coming. And I, I sometimes imagine if, if God would text, not that he would need to text, but should God be, be one who would text? Um, I, I've imagined texts that he would never, hashtags he would never use right? So never would we see a hashtag that says, hashtag, didn't see that coming. Hashtag, OMG. No, wait, 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 wait. That's me. Uh, OMG, what am I going to do now? Um, so I also take great comfort in knowing while we are often caught by surprise, find ourselves in situations saying, now what are we going to do? How are we going to navigate this? Um, 
our dependence and our faith is rooted not in our belief or our belief system, but in a person. And that person is the creator of the universe who says, not only do I know every star in the galaxies, billions of them we now know today, every night I call them out by name. That same God says, and I sustain the universe and the galaxies, that same God says, and I know your name. And, and I am big enough that I can keep an eye on the galaxies and I can keep an eye on you. And I still know the plans that I have for you. And I know the ways in which I intend to use your commitment to me and your service to me to impact the world for the kingdom. And, and so, uh, so my encouragement for you is in many ways, the completion of your program um, and your commitment in seeing this through is only the next step in what God has next in store for you. In which he said, that preparation for the, ne for, the, for the next phase of work that I have for your life, that perhaps you can't imagine, that this is one of the necessary steps in, in helping you get there. And so um, we look forward not only to, to seeing you graduate, hopefully you'll be able to join us in August, um, but seeing what God has in store next for you. Because you see, you and all of the graduates of Evangel AGTS are the living legacy of our institutions, right? Our story is your story. And, um, and so we celebrate you today and we will celebrate um, how God will continue to use you in those places of service that he calls you. I'm so very proud of you and so grateful uh, to, to see you at this point in your journey. And um, I am going to have to like hop off a little, I think it's a little before, it's either 930 or 10 for my next meeting, but I'm going to stay on as long as I can to, um, to, to stay with you as you begin. And thank you, uh, John, for inviting me to join you this morning. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. We appreciate that greeting and your support for our program and your vision for the university at large. And by the way, Dr. Taylor is an alumna of Evangel University and AGTS. Now, Dr. Hager, our Dean at AGTS, came to serve approximately three years ago. He's in his third year. And he is just a tremendous leader. He has invested so much in the Doctor of Ministry program. He uh, is diligent to help the seminary and be a support to me as we lead this program and to help all in the seminary to thrive. Now, he also is an alum of AGTS. Matter of fact, he has his doctorate of ministry from this very program. So he knows exactly what you all are going through because he has been there. It's a joy for me to be a part of his team. Welcome with me, Dr. Tim Hager, Dean of the Assemblies of God Seminary. Dr. Hager? He's having a technical difficulty at this moment. We'll just wait a minute um, uh, for him. One of the joys of technology is when it works, it is fantastic. And if it doesn't, we need to do what Dr. Taylor said, be flexible and just patient. So thank you for your patience now. COVID-19 has created a lot of IT jobs. I know that. <laughs> yes, it has. And I will not go into the opportunity for the stock market with Zoom. Maybe not in a lot of other ways, but with Zoom. Of course, let me encourage you, do not get involved now. It is way too high probably on a bubble that will not last all that long. But you didn't ask for that advice, okay? So don't quote me because I don't wanna get in trouble with the SEC, okay? Go 
So at this time, let me just say our doctorate ministry participants are here as a final requirement for their graduation. It is their public presentation of their projects. And what we're going to do is interview each of these seven graduates. And then Dr. Corey Shipley will interview the next seven graduates beginning at 11 p.m., 11 a.m. And they're going to give you a symposium synopsis of their project as they take their application, all, all of their work, their scholarship, their theology, and integrate it with their ministry context. And that really is the highlight of a doctorate of ministry when you bring scholarship and praxis together, theology, biblical themes, and practical ministry in your area. It really is a venue to equip leaders who will build the kingdom. And that's one of our favorite sayings. What do we do? We build leaders who build the kingdom of God. And I don't know if there's anything more important than advancing God's purposes in our life and through our life and through the ministry that he has given to us. So we're going to move forward here. And you do have a symposium bulletin. And you can follow along in the order of who's going to make their presentation. And from all over, we have our candidates, you know, those who are in Missouri, all the way to Washington State, all the way to North Carolina in the East Coast, to uh, those who have served in uh, Kenya, in East Africa, to right here in Springfield, Missouri. So without any further ado, we're going to welcome our first participant to share his experience with this program. This is Shane Schleschman. And Shane is a leading pastor of a very vibrant church called West End Assembly of God in Richmond, Virginia. Shane, welcome and, and take some time now to tell us your opportunity of ministry context that you've recognized. Thank you, Dr. Vitalia and everyone present. Uh, as you know, millennials and the oldest members of Gen Z, essentially everyone between the ages of 18 and 29, constitute the group most missing in established American congregations. In fact, they form the so-called black hole of church attendance. West End Assembly of God in Richmond, Virginia, as Dr. Battaglia mentioned, is a rich history spanning 51 years and is characterized increasingly diverse body of multiple generations, cultures, ethnicities. It's well known in our community for our missions, arts, and youth ministries. However, since 2004, WEAG has been largely plateaued, experiencing continual attrition, especially in younger generations, resulting and a subsequent overall decline. After I was voted in as lead pastor, uh, that was the moment I pushed pause on this program, as Dr. Taylor said, almost became ABD. <laughs> the following 10 years of serving in family ministries, I couldn't push pause on the vision that I had to build an intergenerational leadership team to effectively lead a five generation church into the next phase of growth and change. So through a study of intergenerational leadership teams, this project revealed that healthy and scriptural churches remain intergenerational, which means that multiple generations are leading together, not just attending together. So this gave us the opportunity to address this critical issue. WEAG has done a good job of collecting young people and growing them through auxiliary ministries like young adults and special worship services. However, in order to build the next generation of leaders, we needed to empower them to lead from the spine of our church rather than the appendage. We needed to face several critical realities key to empowering the next generation. First, we had an ownership challenge. Although we had made significant stride in attracting younger people to the church, we could not successfully inspire young people to take ownership of the ministry in categories, especially like giving, 
missions, serving, vision, and leadership. And on the other side of the spectrum, the highest levels of leadership, which were still occupied predominantly by builders and boomers, had no intentions of stepping down from their roles. We had to address this issue from both ends of the generational spectrum. Second, we had a transfer challenge. The older generation struggled with a willingness to transfer their position to younger people without feeling unappreciated, unwanted, or devalued. This problem is not fixed by choosing one generation over another. We needed to establish and preserve a culture of honor while propelling the mission forward to future generations. And third, we had a traditions challenge. We remained focused on traditions over vision. We needed to develop and establish a DNA of change to avoid future plateaus and cultural prisons. In order to prevent millennials and Gen Z from undergoing the same challenge in 30 years, we needed to create a church culture void of predictability and generational traditions. So in response to researching and addressing this need, this project implemented three events to help build pastoral, a pastoral team of intergenerational leaders who work together to model, to reach across generational and cultural divides. An intergenerational symposium, an intergenerational pastor's retreat, and a lost generation forum were designed to inspire and inform a culture of intergenerational teamwork for the future of WEAC. These three events pulled together our intergenerational pastoral team, providing the data and guidance we needed to make these necessary changes. And as a result, we reinvented our leadership pipeline with actual opportunities for young people to exercise their developing leadership skills. This initiative has involved difficult conversations though with older leaders who have not voluntarily given up their positions of influence. Our goal was not to fire elders from their roles, but to inspire them to identify and lead together with the generation behind them. Thankfully, now on the other side of this discussion, our boomer pastors are embracing the vision to mentor, lead together, and then even follow those who will succeed them. The potential of these initiatives generates endless positive implications for WEAG as well as other churches in our denomination. It's imperative that all churches embrace all generations and stop treating the next generation as the future of the church. They are the church. Jesus said he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Let's join God to work to build a church that is for all generations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shane. That's just fabulous. I can't imagine the hours and uh, blood, sweat, and tears that you've uh, put into this along with your team and love your heart, love your passion. Uh, you know, there are probably so many takeaways for you. Maybe you can share with us, you know, one uh, essential, one core takeaway that you would say you learned from this journey. Thank you. I, I would love to. I would say briefly just that, and to sum it all up, you many churches become what, what I've termed as a, a multi-generational church, but not every church is an intergenerational church, meaning that all generations are not just present, but they are serving, worshiping, and leading together. And we have learned that the challenges of this are massive, but they are also missional. And if we don't do it, um, we've talked about things like imagine the church in 20 years from now um, and, and inspiring. It's inspired a generation that has built this church. I mean, 50 years, they talk about blood, sweat, and tears. My project's nothing compared to their blood, sweat, and tears. We've done nothing compared to what they did to pave the way. So this isn't about replacing a generation. I think the greatest lesson we've learned is what does it look like to lead together, uh, to serve together, to worship together, and, you know, in, in that scenario, not everybody gets what they want. Um, it, and that's, that's family, isn't it? Uh, so it's been a great lesson and uh, a lot of takeaways. That's fantastic. So if I was just asked the same question to one of your 
uh, congregants. And I said, what was one of the takeaways as a person in the congregation from the leadership of your pastor for transitioning to an intergenerational uh, church? What might they say? Well, hopefully you asked one that stayed uh, first and uh, they, they would have a different takeaway depending. I, I think, I joke, but I think they would probably have to mention somewhere in that this is painful. Um, you know, it's, it's just transition is, is difficult. Every transition in life is difficult and it doesn't, you don't grow. There's no growth without pain. And your leadership's only as strong as your pain tolerance, right? So um, I think they would say something along the lines of the cost. But I also think they would say, especially our older generation would say, uh, they would speak of the younger generation as, as a gift. And I think the younger generation would say exactly the same thing of the older generation. They didn't realize we have, we have uh, now Zoom groups. They were, they were small groups, uh, but we have Zoom groups now that are of all different generations. We have our 50 plus community serving in our youth group. Um, we have, this is not a value that you can somehow place and have a youth service and, and, and say that we're a church of, that have young people. In order to be a church of young people, you have to follow your young people and interact with you. And, and that's a challenge. And I think they would, I hope they would say um, that it was worth the cost and, uh, and encourage any church to say, push through this. Don't just send them out and graduate them, you know, to, to their own church. Uh, grow together and lead together and look and see what the kingdom of God was meant to look like. Thank you so much. And we really appreciate you sharing a portion of your project with us. And uh, now I just want to say thank you, Dr. Schleschman. <laughs> Great job. So we're going to move on to our next participant. That's Darnell Williams. And Darnell is the lead pastor of New Life Church in Lima, Ohio. He also serves as a secretary treasurer of the International Ministry Network, as well as holding the position of vice president of the Assemblies of God National Black Fellowship. He is also an executive presbyter to what we call the language other groups. And we are so grateful to have him here Darnell, share with us a little bit about the opportunity for, that your project addressed. Thanks, Dr. Battaglia. Uh, really grateful for this moment, for this opportunity. Uh, the Pew Research Center noted that in the 2005, two, excuse me, 2015 study, that the Assemblies of God is the most diverse Protestant movement in the country. Simply stated, the Assemblies of God churches mirror the racial demographics of America in general. Yet within the Assemblies of God districts, elected black leadership is only occupied by two individuals, Dr. Samuel Huddleston, who serves as the assistant superintendent of the Northern California, Nevada district and myself. Further, the general presbytery is, com is comprised of district elected executives and pastor representatives from each district and the representatives of language and ethnic fellowships. Of the current 274 general presbyters, 88 of those or 32% are representative of ethnic or language fellowships. The vast majority of GP representation is by ethnic fellowship representation, not elected or appointed district leaders. The leadership at the district levels are not represented of the nation's populations or of the black AG minority constituency. So my project focused on the fact that the Assemblies of God has organically be, uh, become reflective of the nation as, it, as in its inherent adherence. And it's now time to tackle the problem of developing the same reflection in its leadership. The governance model of the fellowship is primarily based upon elected leadership and minorities face the daunting task to occupy leadership positions unless those positions are expressly created for them 
or for qualified leaders that are appointed to said positions. So simply stated, trying to tackle how do we cultivate opportunities of leadership for African-Americans in the assemblies of God. Thank you, because it makes a tremendous contribution to the assemblies of God and to the kingdom of God. So talk to us a little bit about how did you address these concerns? Certainly. Uh, the first thing I did, the timing of my project kind of really uh, meshed well with the election of our new uh, general superintendent, uh, Doug Clay. So I had an opportunity to sit down and interview him. And uh, he directed me to work with the Great Lakes superintendent cohort. So I began to meet with them in August of 2018. And we went through a process known as appreciative inquiry, where we looked at the opportunities that could be presently, um, uh, uh, presently available, as well as creating new opportunities that would allow for the cultivation of leadership of African-Americans within the Great Lakes region. Uh, I also conducted some one-on-one -on -one interviews with those that have been identified as being innovative Assembly of God district leaders. Those that are on kind of the front end of this, those that are the innovators right now. And those leaders were uh, Dr. Duane Durst from the uh, New York Ministry Network who serves as a superintendent there. Uh, superintendent Rich Gear of the Southern Cal Ministry Network. Uh, my own superintendent, Daniel Miller of the International Ministry Network. Uh, again, Dr. Sam Huddleston, who serves as the assistant of Northern Cal Nevada and as the black executive presbyter, along with his uh, superintendent, Brett Allen of the Northern California Nevada District. And so we looked at the intentional things that they are doing proactive, cultivate opportunities for African-Americans. You know, what I'm hearing is this breadth of, of uh, resource that you brought into your research and application, which is so very wise, especially to have these key leaders of influence who have a lot of knowledge and are very engaged in the very thing that you're talking about. So tell us a little bit about the results. What did you find out? Yeah, it was it was really interesting. Um, in August of 2019, we did a follow up session with the Great Lakes superintendent, and I kind of took what we discussed in 2018, combined that with my research and presented with them a very robust conversation about some focal points that they could use for practical implementation. Um, I also uh, really got a grasp on what these um, early innovative early adopters are doing to cultivate these leadership opportunities. And one of the things that really stood out was just those that are in leadership have to be very intentional about constantly looking at the organization and asking themselves the question, is everyone accurately represented here? Because the research just clearly pointed that this is not going to just happen it's going to have to take some intentionality. It's going to have to take planning. It's going to have to take um, some really introspective look at the team to see what can I do to create these opportunities for minorities. And in my case, in this study, particularly African-Americans. Thank you, Dr. Williams. We celebrate you and are so grateful for your hard work and your project that is going to contribute to advancing God's purposes. So at this time, the reality is that ministry is about building leaders through discipleship. And our next participant is doing this very thing as he works to plant the church in Louisville, Kentucky. Stan, welcome. Tell us a little bit about your opportunity that you addressed. Thank you, Dr. Um, it would not be an understatement to say that the health of the church for the future is dependent upon disciples fulfilling the command to make disciples. And the impact that the church has on its community makes it imperative 
that disciples understand exactly what biblical discipleship means. And the knowing and doing of the Great Commission provides a dichotomy of understanding in both knowledge and in implementation. Uh, the church in the United States is shrinking, both in number of adherents and in total number of local churches. And this alarming trend, if it's left unabated, will continue to negatively shape the soul of disciples and our nation. Uh, an estimated 30,000 churches closed their doors between 2006 and 2013. And only about one-fifth of the population attends church regularly. And the number of people who never attend, 29%, is greater than those who regularly attend, which is 23%. From these uh, statistics, there was a problem that we identified. It's that discipleship is not being fully expressed in the church. The answer to this problem has been to develop programs such as Sunday school or men's group, women's group, rangers, missionettes. The, these programs, uh, and we use those to meet the mission of the church. However, programs can never fully implement the divine call to each follower of Christ to make disciples. Often programs relieve the individual believer of the responsibility to share the good news with and help others mature in their faith. Uh, programs also tend to put discipleship mantle onto pastors and church leaders. Uh, this should never replace the discipleship model that Jesus gave to his disciples. And so all of this raises some questions that need to be answered. How can we as pastors and as leaders mobilize congregants through a process of embracing whole life discipleship? And what kind of tools can we provide them in their discipleship journey? And how can we encourage the developing of relationships with believers and unbelievers over the building of programs? <clears throat> Thank you, Stan. You know, what, what I'm hearing you say is that you have identified the <clears throat> difference between programs and the purposes <clears throat> of a church. And one <clears throat> of the core purposes is discipleship. And in discipleship, we're growing our people in scripture, in prayer, in relationship. And I think it's a very important topic. So thank you for addressing it. So tell us a little bit about how you addressed it. Okay. Well, the, the lead pastor at the Trinity Chapel Assembly of God, he had already been leading the church away from a program oriented group toward a community uh, oriented or, or what we call community transformation. And uh, with the process, as Dr. Shane had said, the process of change is difficult and you're not talking about um, hours or days of, of, of institutional, you're talking about decades. And so um, what we began to do, changing it corporately was difficult. So we began to take steps to lead the change more individually within groups and leaders. So what I did is I developed a series of teachings on discipleship which was based on the discipleship dynamics assessment. And this assessment then was administered to the volunteers that attended training sessions over the course of 11 weeks. And the underlying belief was that if believers understand what it truly means to be a disciple and whole life discipleship, then that belief will help shape their worldview and transform the church and the surrounding community. I so believe it, Stan. Mm -hmm. Uh, very, very important to do. So uh, I'm intrigued as to what the results were from your research. Okay, so what we did is we uh, they took the assessment at the beginning of the process, and then at and then and then we did 11 weeks of teaching. And then at the end, we took the assessment a second time. And what we found was we had indeed created a clearer understanding, a clearer comprehension of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. And participants who previously understood discipleship being accomplished in the setting of a church program now had the understanding that the discipleship is done wherever they are. And so this shift became more evident in the months following the project's completion as we, we, we saw participants um, share a renewed desire uh, to grow in their faith, some that ones that had plateaued and, and just have become, we, we do the program now, they had plateaued, they began to a sense of renewed desire to grow uh, in their faith. And then not only that, but share their faith with others. And so one of the key things we did develop a small group structure, uh, which they are now doing with the e-groups. Uh, but this structure was called from other groups, successes and failures. 
and they were tailored to meet our specific church mission. And so I trained small group leaders in many aspects of leading, training, outreach, and discipling. And we began our small groups and saw them grow, both in spiritual depth and numerically. And within this structure, relationship building has become the basis for the growth and the church is moving uh, from being an, an, a program-oriented um, to a transformational community. You know, I love that phrase you used. A discipleship is where you are and where you go. What a great biblical principle. We celebrate you. Thank you, Dr. Cook. We appreciate your passion for discipleship. Thank you. Now, our next participant is Chad Slaughter. And Chad is a marketplace minister in Cary, North Carolina. He has a lot of experience in this local work. He also serves as a consultant to pastors and churches. Chad, talk to us a little bit about the opportunity that you recognized and then addressed. Thanks so much, Dr. Battaglia. Yeah, during my tenure of pastoral ministry, I observed that pastors typically do not receive formal conflict engagement training. Uh, neither I nor any of the pastors with whom I had served during my tenure had ever been required to gain conflict engagement skills prior to their ordination. And when pastors and congregational leaders are ill-equipped to address conflict successfully, they risk succumbing to Satan's deceptive, divisive strategies designed to render local churches both anemic and ineffective. I also observe that all too often pastors and congregational leaders avoid conflict rather than engaging in honest, respectful, constructive dialogue. Church leaders who avoid conflict rather than engaging in dialogue in a biblical manner miss an opportunity to strengthen relationships. Anecdotally, I have learned that pastors and congregational leaders do not feel equipped or empowered to approach those with whom they're experiencing conflict. Spiritual maturity does not correlate directly to proper conflict engagement. Often, spiritually mature leaders misuse discernment and Christ-like character as reasons to overlook interpersonal issues that they should address directly. Pastors and congregational leaders must lead others to fight for peace rather than abdicate their Christ-given mandate to go and tell their brother their fault. I, I just love the way you phrase that, the recognition of, of the importance of conflict management. And you're right, we all face it in the church, you know, in the community, in our homes. And it's very important that we have the skills to uh, deal with this. And I, I wanna ask you in a second, you know, how you went about addressing uh, this opportunity. But a part of it I know is that you came to HUTS for your Doctorate of Ministry program, and we taught you about conflict management. A little yeah. plug for us. Yeah. So, uh, Chad, talk to us a little bit about how you went about uh, addressing this issue. So in response to the realities that uh, I just described, uh, I studied biblical lessons, first and foremost, regarding conflict, and then conducted a review of business-related, church-related, and scholarly literature written on this topic. I traced the motif of conflict through scripture and then passed business-related, church-related, and scholarly literature through the filter of God's word and created a six-hour skills development training program that equips pastors and congregational leaders to handle conflict successfully. Uh, I entitled it Engage, and the training program served as not only the fruit of my DMIM project research, but also satisfied a personal commitment that I had made to redeem negative experiences from my leadership past and to strengthen areas that I believed were some of the weakest in my own uh, leadership skill set. Prior to completing my field project, I surveyed members of two nat national church networks, in an effort to either confirm or to disprove my presumption that most pastors and leaders do not receive conflict engagement training prior to earning their ministerial credentials or to assuming their leadership roles. 
And by con conducting the survey, I had hoped to better understand the percentage of leaders who needed to develop the skills necessary, again, to address conflict successfully. I received 458 contacts from two church networks to whom I sent the survey by email. And by the conclusion of the survey period, I had received 57 completed surveys, which translated to a 12.4% response rate. And the completed surveys I received confirmed my underlying presumptions and added to the sense of urgency I had built that conflict engagement training must be part of every vocational minister's leadership training regimen. 67% of the survey's participants indicated that they did not receive conflict resolution training before serving in their current leadership or ministry role. 100% of those who indicated that they had received conflict training said that it was helpful or very helpful, while more than 50% of the participants responded said that they felt equipped, confident, and called to engage in conflict-resolving uh, dialogue, only 4% of the respondents indicated that they strongly agreed that past conflict uh, engagement moments in, in their leadership were positive experiences. And I believe that when churches, uh, church leaders possess the requisite knowledge, skills, and attitudes related to conflict engagement, they more readily choose to address and not avoid conflict when it arises. Chad, you said you created a six-hour seminar. Yes. No wonder the Demon Projects are about 225 pages. So great work with that. Talk to us a little bit about the results that you've discovered. Sure. The statistical results of a pre-test, post-test questionnaire that I employed during my training uh, confirmed that the program was effective at improving the participants' knowledge, skills, and attitudes toward conflict engagement. Uh, the arithmetic mean of the response values increased for all 21 of the instruments questions. This confirmed that the participants, again, knowledge, skills, and attitudes improved as a result of their participation in the training program. The standard deviation of the response values decreased for all 21 of the questions. This indicated that the group's collective expertise and attitude towards conflict engagement grew more homogenous as a result of the program. 19 of the 21 response values showed a statistically significant improvement. And this indicated again that despite the relatively uh, sample, small sample size of only 21 questionnaires, the positive change was indeed substantial. So again, my project addressed uh, what I believe is a poignant and pervasive need within the church. Pastors and congregational leaders must prepare themselves to address interpersonal conflict successfully. When church leaders address conflict in a godly way that aligns with scripture, the kingdom of God advances. Thank you, Dr. Slaughter. How we appreciate your project and the positive impact it is going to be making in local churches around the country for your consulting business. Thank now, you before so we take an interlude uh, of uh, our time together, we're going to introduce uh, Eleanor Q after a video which shows our 14 graduates in their ministry context. I hope you enjoy this video. I know it's coming. So that video is just not my face, which you do not want to continue to see. We have a break on the way as soon as we get through. <laughs> this life is a journey, a path made for me. With every step I take As I run this race I'm becoming the person you call me to be A child of God, a life redeemed So I set my eyes on you Jesus, I'm ready I'm ready This is the journey of a lifetime. 
Hope you enjoyed that video. At this point, we have Dean Hager with us. Dean Hager, come and share greeting with our participants. It's good to uh, finally be back here. Let's see, let me make it. Yeah, my, can you hear me? Good. Oh, you're good. Hey, well, it's good to finally be with you here. A little technical difficulty. I'm just downstairs uh, uh, with uh, John, but it's a beautiful day in Springfield. I went ahead and put on the regalia that I would have had if you were here on site at AGTS. Beautiful spring day, and we're so proud of you. Uh, at, here at the seminary, we're reminded in 2 Corinthians 3, 2, where the Apostle Paul said, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts and known and read by everyone. Uh, as we have been able to have the privilege of pouring into you, you have poured into us and you have built relationships with us and we've deposited within you. But as you're going out and continuing your uh, fields of ministry, we know that uh, God's going to use you in a powerful way because his work over these last few years, why you've been here at HGTS, has helped expand your capacity, your competencies, and you've understood to a greater depth the call that God has on your life. He's got you exactly where he needs you to be. A matter of fact, uh, you now are a part of our community and our family of over 4,200 alumni. People, individuals just like you are in, in 150 nations in six continents. And so the impact that you're having is part of what we have collectively having gone through the experience here at AGTS. So I just want to let you know that uh, we love you. We pray for you. You're part of our community. You're part of our AGTS family. And congratulations. It's great to be with you here today to listen to your symposium projects here in this context. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Hager. We appreciate it so much taking time to invest with your greeting to our wonderful graduates. At this time, we want to introduce Eleanor Q from Lansing, Michigan. Eleanor has a tremendous ministry in a medical clinic called His Healing Hands. Also, she is planting a church. She's very busy. She has a great heart for missions and does extensive work in Kenya, East Africa. 
Eleanor, welcome. Talk to us a little bit about your project and what did you address? Thank you so much, Dr. Bataglia. In 2007, I went on a medical mission trip to Africa. I was sent by my church, myself, and many other physicians. And we were there for 10 days. And in 10 days, we took care of 10,000 people. It was a very, very busy mission trip. And at the conclusion of the mission trip, I went back to the US with a desire to go back to Africa where I'm from and not only take care of the people, but also teach them how to prevent communicable and non-communicable diseases. And in 2019, my dream came to pass when I went to Malawi. Now, when we look at the WHO, and WHO stands for World Health Organization, when we look at their statistics, according to the WHO, communicable and non-communicable diseases are a challenge in Africa. So let's look at the communicable diseases. And I'm gonna give you an example of airborne diseases like COVID-19, uh, tuberculosis. So when we look at those airborne diseases, the burden is disproportionate, meaning more people are dying in low income nations from, from airborne diseases. And when we look at non-communicable diseases, let's look at cardiovascular diseases, for example. According to the WHO, unless we do something and something needs to be done at the individual and at the nation level, by 2030, cardiovascular diseases will remain the single leading cause of mortality and morbidity. Now, this is the good news. The good news is we can do something. We can do something because communicable and non-communicable diseases are preventable. And prevention of diseases involves health education and promotion to empower people such as pastors and lay leaders to gain knowledge, skills, information to make healthy choices for themselves and for the congregations. Eleanor, thank you so much. What important work and a monumental task is what it seems. Uh, love your passion, uh, love how much you care about people and the gifts that God has given you in this medical uh, work. Talk to us a little bit about how you addressed your project. It was an amazing experience. So for my project, I designed a seminar and my seminar was to teach pastors and lay leaders about two things. So I want to teach them about the biblical foundation regarding the role of the church in the area of health promotion and healing. Basically, I look at the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and study what does God say about sending pastors and lay leaders to teach the people on preventing diseases. And the second part of my project was to provide an education regarding the promotion of health by, by addressing the burden of communicable and non-communicable diseases and also physical injuries such as intimate partner violence. And for my project, I focus on Sub-Sahara Africa. Now, the seminar, was done in Malawi. So I was in Malawi in September from the 9th to the 11th, and 12 pastors and church leaders came to the seminar. They completed the seminar, and all participants, they took a pre-test and a post-test so I can evaluate, so we can evaluate the effectiveness of the seminar. I'm not sure how to respond to that. That is just fabulous. You know, one of the things I really love about what you've uh, done is you haven't just practiced your medical work, you've built it off of a biblical theological perspective. So we need both scholarship, right, and practice. 
biblical theology, but we also need the applied theology of our research. So you've obviously done that. So I'm really eager to hear what the results were. The results were astounding, amazing. So when we compare the pre-test data with the post-test data, we had a statistically significant change, meaning all the pastor and the district leaders had gained enough knowledge and skills to be able to prevent the diseases that they were facing. And the knowledge they have gained was significant. Let's look at an example like STD, like sexually transmitted diseases like HIV. So when I began the seminar, the pastors and the leaders, they had some knowledge. And although they had some knowledge, the, what they gained after the seminar was still significant, was still stat statistically significant. And when I look at all the, the teaching, all the topics that I engaged them during the seminar, including the biblical foundation, they all gain statistically significant knowledges. And at the end of the seminar, before the seminar, actually 23% of the participants, they felt confident to go and teach the congregation. And by the end of the seminar, 100% of them, all of them felt confident to go and teach their congregation about how to prevent diseases. And even after I left Malawi, I was in the US and I got a, a message, a WhatsApp message from one of the district leader in Malawi. And he sent me a message, what he, he was doing, he had called pastors from his district and he was going to teach them the material that he learned from my seminar. So I truly believe that the seminar was very relevant the pastor and the leaders learn quite some information. And then by the time I left, they, they, they praised me for the seminar and they really encouraged me to continue and teach that seminar because this information are needed in the African context. Thank you, Dr. Q, we appreciate your passion and commitment to the medical field, especially in light of the coronavirus, which is the present reality that, that we're facing. Now at this time, our next participant is Raphael Machuca. And Raphael works in the healthcare field as well as a chaplain at the VA Medical Center in Poplar Bluff, Missouri. He is also a chaplain for the Marine Corps. Raphael, tell us what you do in your spare time and how you addressed your project. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, long time listener, uh, first time caller. So <laughs> I wanna address the project. Um, I have worked as a chaplain in the medical field in numerous settings, such as hospitals and home care facilities. I have noticed during this time, there has been a push for holistic care to patients. Holistic care focuses on addressing the mental the physical and the spiritual aspects of a person to bring more of a holistic approach. When it comes to executing holistic care, however, um, it became apparent that when it came to the spiritual aspect, there were many interpretations of what this meant, um, even to people even ignoring the spiritual aspect of holistic care um, in a medical setting situation. Um, spiritual people are faced, when they're faced with medical situations, they look to their faith and strength for encouragement. Um, it is also a time they are vulnerable to experience spiritual distress and need extra support. So in other words, um, as we, people that are in the hospitals or in the home care facilities or nursing homes, um, and they're there by themselves and away from family, away from even attending church services and so forth. Um, their spiritual need begins to increase and there's a, a, a growth in spirituality, let's say, for a need of, of, of that support. The lack of, of, of the support in this area is troubling if not properly addressed. Upon inquiring as to why chaplains were not notified in certain circumstances, I found out that there was a lack of training or misunderstanding of what spiritual care looks like. A common misconception 
um, one of the medical staff, for example, was, you know, call a chaplain um, only when the patient is about to die. And as chaplains, we are grateful, we're, we're thankful for that. And of course, we're there to, to be of support. However, um, that's more that we're more than, than, than just that. We're more than, than just that aspect. We can provide more support to the family even before in the life situations. Thank you, uh, Raphael. Really appreciate that. It just just amazes me on all the projects and, and now yours on how important your work is and how the contribution will really affect uh, the health community. So talk to us a little bit about what the results were and, and how you addressed it. Okay, on how I addressed it, um, to help individuals overcome um, their misconceptions, I held a one day seminar that presented information compiled from research, interviews with spiritual leaders and knowledge gained while professionally as a chaplain. Although the seminar was open to anyone interested, I kind of purposely recruited um, physicians, social workers, even housekeeping. Uh, additionally, I also sent uh, flyers in the neighborhood, in the community, to churches, um, nursing homes, home care facilities as well. Um, um, home, home Instead um, allowed me to use their center to teach the seminar, so I'm grateful for that. The seminar itself was broken down into three parts. The first section was on the subject of spirit, signs of spiritual distress, where I methodically addressed several signs from a biblical and contemporary viewpoint. I provided education as to why it is important to be aware of such signs and the effects of spiritual distress can have on a patient. I integrated views from various faith groups as well. So this is, goes beyond just, I wanted to see what other faith groups viewpoints was on spiritual distress as well. Uh, the second part of the seminar was focused on holistic care of the mind, body, and spirit. I communicated how as a chaplain we're contributed to the spiritual aspect of holistic care. This section showed the importance of providing holistic care to the people we serve and show several avenues to accomplish this. And finally, the third component of the seminar regarded spiritual assessments and making referrals to a chaplain. Medical and support staff um, do not need to provide the spiritual support. Um, however, if they're aware of the signs of spiritual distress and recognize those signs, they, re they can request or refer to a chaplain who's able to come in and provide that care. Um, the seminar itself was interactive. There were times of teaching, videos, answering questions, and breaking out into small groups in order to grasp the subject matter. Um, the results of it, the survey and data discussion revealed that the presentation answered a lot of questions attendees had about addressing spirituality in their patients. Those in attendance represented a diverse group, including doctors, nurses, um, caregivers, spiritual leaders. And uh, on the spirituality side, there was a, a mix of various faiths as well. Some also had a strong connection to religious faiths, all the way to people who have no connections of, of faith. This made the feedback very interesting. The seminar equipped then with the tools and directions to identify someone who may be struggling spiritually and help find those to provide support to meet those spiritual needs. Um, it increased their awareness of spiritual distress and fostered confidence to refer to a chaplain who can better assist the patient's needs. By addressing the signs of spiritual distress in healthcare and setting, we can see a true holistic approach in variety of patient care settings. The holistic approach that you've taken and the way that you're all in to bring uh, spiritual influence to those that you serve. So thank you, Dr. Machuca. Now at this time, I wanna introduce another chaplain, Peter Landers, who has been serving in a different type of ministry setting. Chapter Landers 
serves at the, as the department head of religious studies at the Federal Corrections Institution in Greenville, Illinois. Now he also serves as the chaplain for the US Air Force. And what's most interesting is that he serves both airmen and inmates. Think about that and the breadth of what he has to know and do and have the anointing of God to serve in the way that he does. So Peter, tell us about your ministry opportunity and the context of how you addressed it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Battaglia. I'm honored to be here and I'm always happy when they let me out of prison. No, I'm not an inmate, I'm a chaplain. And when I'm not behind bars, while well, I'm fighting C-130s with my airmen down in Little Rock. And so one thing I noticed is with lots of counseling as a chaplain, that's a lot of what we do. Of course, I wish I could have had tons of pictures of our congregation in the prison, but we, they kind of frown on video cameras and, and stuff within prison. But a lot of what we do is when we counsel, you have these young individuals that are flooding into the system, not only the prison, but within the military. And you find out that a lot of them are in distress. They're confused. And one of the first things I do when I come in for counseling is I begin to ask the question, who are you? And of course, a lot of them get, what? What do you mean, who am I? Who are you? And they might say their name, but they really don't know. And a lot of them have developed these identities that were built from family, peers, social labels. And of course, if you look at the public schools, they're social initiatives. And they come in so confused because they really haven't considered the question of identity. And I realize how important this is, especially this war that is waged within our society. Everybody is trying to tell people, this is your identity. When I look at scripture, I see that God did that from the very beginning. If you begin to look throughout scripture from Adam and Eve to Abraham to Moses, God sits down even with David. God sits down with them and he says, this is who you are and this is what I want you to do. And then you have people like Moses, wait a minute, God, that's not who I am. I stutter and I can't be a leader. And David's like, well, I'm a shepherd. I can't be, have a great kingdom. But that's the beauty of the word of God. That's the beauty of identity and what the Bible has for these young airmen. Because identity is where behavior comes from. Many times within the church, we focus on behavior. Well, don't do this, don't do that. But I think, you know, the center of discipleship is identity. It's who we are. And out of that identity flows these behaviors. And if we focus on behaviors, don't do this and do that, well, we're hurting ourselves. We need to focus on identity instead of I am a criminal or I'm an alcoholic or I'm young and dumb. No, I am a child of God. I am a new creation. And as you focus on identity, then all of a sudden after time, the behaviors begin to change. Change the identity and the behaviors will follow. And so my project seeks to come alongside these individuals and restore inmates and airmen to this biblical model of identity. So we sit down, discard, and get rid of all these faulty labels and all the things that society or, or people have said, this is who you are, and allow them to, as much as you can, begin to clear that away and focus on this is who God says I am, and this is God's mission for my life. And so that is what I... Uh, found that was the problem that I needed to address. You know, Peter, I love the fact that you've uh, tied identity to God as we've been created in his image. And uh, because of that, uh, you just made a statement that we need to listen to what God says about us. Amen. And that is so important as it shapes our esteem, as it shapes on how we see ourselves, and the result is eventually how we behave and how we express that. So thanks for tying that to uh, God himself and his wonderful voice that speaks life and encouragement to each one of us. So talk to us now a little bit about how you addressed this opportunity. 
So what I did was I decided to hold a two session workshop. And of course the two different, I mean, even though, you know, people are, are so much alike, whether in the prison or whether in the military, but I decided to hold a workshop for both. And of course with the military, uh, when I first started, no one, no one kind of came. And so as always, what do we do? We have to bribe. And so I said, hey, we're gonna have Chick-fil-A. And of course it wasn't on Sunday, it was on Saturday. And so we brought in Chick-fil-A where 11 people turned up and they ate it up, they loved it. And so we went through the question of who am I? And in many of them, it was just, you know, life breaking just to even consider that because they never, as young people, they never considered those questions. And so we even had a little piece of paper that they had a circle with me in the middle and they began to look at the scriptures. Who am I? Well, I'm a brother. Well, I'm, you know, poor or I'm rich or I'm whatever the descriptors. I'm a male. I'm a female. I am. And they began to explore. And that's what a lot of the first session was. And at the end of it, we were given questionnaires and surveys and they had reflection homework. And so they began to explore who they were. They looked at income status, race, gender, public and private descriptors, religion, and many other areas of their life, bridges out of poverty. We talked about that book, which looks at the different uh, patterns and behaviors of income. Like within the poverty, you have to know how to fix a car or have to know how to find the best places that have you know, welfare or, or deals or how to fill out those applications. Whereas the middle class, they're more looking at how do I get my kids into the best sports activities. And so you find that each one of these areas has different identities and the behaviors and patterns that they live in. And so we began to explore that and they really ate it up. The second session, we compared it to the biblical model. So this is who they said they were. And now we're going to look at what the Bible says that you are. And so we fought, tried to find out if what they constructed lined up with the word of God. And as we look throughout the Bible, especially when we look at Genesis, and we, we see this pattern throughout, that first of all, one of the areas was God is our creator. So he's the one who designed us. So let's think about this. The perfect one designed us. Why would we go to the imperfect of society or family, I, I love family, but of all these other areas without going to the very one who has the manual who put us together. The second thing we looked at was community. You know, it's not good for us to be alone. We were made for community. We were made, especially the institution of the family. And then out of that, the community at large, we were made to be and to function life with others. And the last area is that we are stewards. God made us stewards of his kingdom. And so we began to explore that. And then we began to explore, who am I? And many people are like, wow, you know, I say I'm a Christian, but that's really a stark difference from who I really am. Because if you think about stewardship, they're thinking, well, my life is just to get retirement and to be happy and comfortable. Does that line up with scripture? And so we had some wonderful uh, times in that study. And, and that's how I did to address the problem. Thank you, Peter. You know, it really sounds transformative, kind of a renewing of the mind uh, process. I'm very interested in uh, what the outcomes were uh, through your work and, and kind of how that uh, impacted those that were a part of your session. Okay, so what I did with the results is I had all this paperwork and I began because I did a Rosenberg self-esteem scale. I also did an identity one that I designed that you can see within the dissertation there, but there's these different areas that I did and it was amazing to me. And I'll give a couple of the highlights. First of all, in the very beginning, the Rosenberg esteem set, uh, scale, only I think about 90%, 14% had a high view of themselves. Most people said, I don't have a positive view of myself. Also as well, everybody that participated said they were Christian. Yet when it came down to it, only 54% rated that Christianity was a major influence on their identity. I was amazed at that because you think if they say, well, I'm a Christian, well, that should be almost 100%, right? But no, 
you see the same thing within George Barna Institute. I saw a study after I was doing this called what most influences the self identity of Americans. And they found the same thing that 38% of Americans acknowledge that religious faith influences their identity. So one of the, the results that I was amazed, how could you say you're a Christian? That's one thing we presented to the group and everybody was going, you know what? I think you're right. And we found that within that, that that's where a lot of the distress, that's where a lot of distorted, divergent, and destructive behaviors come from. Because we don't go to God to develop our identity. We're doing this hodgepodge of identity from all these areas. And then we wonder why we're stressed and depressed and unhappy. But we're realizing, and especially within the class, um, I won't necessarily go through all the statistics, but you can see just with a two session workshop, a dramatic increase. And in fact, when we did the final survey, over 90% of them are like, man, we need more of these classes. I need to know who I am because I think this will change my life. And so that's what we looked at is that looking at the biblical model alleviates distress and it builds kingdom people. You know, Peter, it, it sounds like your message was one of hope, give, giving people hope that their identity is found in Christ and and the best that that can be, the best um, uh, version of themselves that is not discovered from culture and community, but that is discovered from the biblical text and the God of the scriptures. So Dr. Landers, thank you so much for presenting uh, with us uh, today. And now we want to introduce another video to you. And this video is from our advisors and professors who have had direct contact with our 14 graduates. I hope you enjoy this video. Big shout out to Dr. Shane. Schlesman, thank you so much, Shane, for letting me be a part of your doctoral project. You did great work. You served West End Assembly really well. You served the ministry network here in Oregon really well, too. I always give uh, this suggestion to people getting their doctoral degrees. Everybody who meets you has to call you Dr. Schlesman for the first week. After that, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Take care, friend. Bye. It was really a pleasure to work as the advisor for both Christy Lemley and Darnell Williams. Their dissertations were absolutely superb. They took topics that were meaningful for today. Christie's was on revival, and what a great topic for what is happening right now because people, I think, are going to be coming back to the church in ways that we have seen for a long time. And Darnell did an excellent topic regarding um, having all people groups at the table for leadership. Blessings to both of you and congratulations. This is Charlie Self and I want to congratulate every one of our DMIN graduates for this accomplishment. Congratulations on your hard work and thank you for your unique contributions to the body of Christ and to leadership worldwide. I'm so proud to have been part of several of your journeys, but I'm proud of every single one of our grads. You are indeed leaders worth following. God bless you as you adventure into new things in the days ahead. Good morning, everyone. This is Earl Kreps coming to you from my backyard in Redmond, Washington, near Seattle. I'm here to congratulate you on this great accomplishment of presenting your doctoral research at today's d -Men Symposium. I remember the moment in my own life as a student in the program and then later as its director, and I'm thrilled to be able to say well done to each of you today. This experience has given you something that life cannot take away. So cherish that and spread it around. Congratulations. Eleanor, thank you very much as a medical doctor coming across and, and committing yourself to pastoral ministry and your project that has helped so many people uh, to um, prepare the Church of Jesus Christ to serve in the community, both in Africa and here. Congratulations. Congratulations, Peter Landers, in completing your project. I am so very proud of you. I am happy that the Lord is going to use this for his kingdom 
in chaplaincy and in many other ways. God bless you. Hello, Raphael. Just letting you know that I am so proud of you that you have made it. I know in the last couple of years, there have been so many obstacles that you and your family had to overcome, but you did. And I am just so proud of you, but I want you to know that the same Holy Spirit that brought you through all of those obstacles is going to use all of that sometime in your ministry because nothing is lost in God's economy. God bless you as you go forward. Well, greetings 2020 doctors. I am so proud of you all for completing your doctoral journey and I'm so thankful that I got to be a part of that and I'm so thankful for all of the work of your hands and all of your projects. I know that they have global impact and I know that God's going to continue to bless your life through those. I think of Paul the Apostle uh, in Philippians 1 where he says every time that he thought of the Philippians he thought of them uh, with great thankfulness and with great love because he had them in his heart. And you are all in my heart and I thank God for you. Congratulations on the completion of your Doctor of Ministry program. God has prepared you for such a time as this. Hey everybody, huge congratulations to you all for the great work you've done in wrapping up your Doctor of Ministry projects. Congratulations on the completion of this project. It's been an investment in the advancing of the Church of Jesus Christ. Congratulations on completing your project. That is no small accomplishment. And uh, I know that it's going to be a blessing to many. So congratulations again. Congratulations on realizing this tremendous milestone. You have now added your name to a long and distinguished list of servant leaders making a powerful impact for the gospel sake around the world. Well done, my friends. Well, I hope you appreciated that video from our advisors and professors who have had a profound effect on our graduates. So if you would all join me in appreciating our graduates and give yourselves an applause for a fantastic presentation. I like to close out our time together in a word of prayer. If you would pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we are here today. We're grateful for these graduates, their hard work, their diligence. It's not just a project. It's not just something they have to do to get their degree. It is an investment. It is for the reason of advancing your kingdom, your purposes, to see the lives of men and women transformed, to give hope to those who are hopeless, to help uh, many find the grace and the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that you would continue to bless our graduates as they go from today, as they go into the continued areas of their ministry, that you would prosper them. Holy Spirit, that you would anoint them. Help them to do things that they cannot do on their own. And Lord, we also thank you for all the spouses of these graduates, for their love, for their time, for their investment, for their care, for their patience, for their belief in their spouse. We ask that you would bless them as well. Now, Lord, as we go today, we ask that you've received glory and that through every one of our lives, we would honor you and we would live for you, giving ourselves holy with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, in love with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, friends. We appreciate it. We also want you to rejoin us. We hope you will. We invite you at 11 a.m. to hear our next seven graduates. Thank you, and may God bless you.